Colleagues, please welcome Simon Fanshaw to deliver the AUA Golden Jubilee Guest Lecture 2011. Christopher, thank you very much indeed, and I'm extremely honoured to be asked to come and deliver this lecture on your 50th year, which, um, of course, is also Sussex's 50th year, which is a, a lovely coincidence. Um, yes, I, I am the chair of the Governors of Sussex, so just by way of um, some creds, I suppose. Um, I was a law graduate uh, at Sussex, which is kind of fun, because it's a kind of poacher turned gamekeeper thing. And uh, when we started uh, um, a, a restructure... <laughs> new vice-chancellor, new chief executive restructure, you know, new broom, new rules. And uh, we started the restructure, and there was quite an argument with the students at one stage, and it got a little bit personal, and, and we were standing on a December the 1st afternoon of... of uh, we do World AIDS Day, and we have a tree in the middle of the university, and uh, for some years now I've been kind of turning on the lights, and then there's a choir, and we do stuff, because we have quite a lot of work around AIDS and HIV at Sussex. So we were doing this, and students were standing there with the old placards, you know, doing their kind of student thing, and that's all very good. So I had to kind of negotiate with them and say, look, here's the thing, can we do the AIDS choir thing first and then can we do the kind of placard cuts thing afterwards because we kind of you know it's not working to do both at once you know we kind of have to have an agreement here so I kind of negotiated a slightly uneasy piece and the deal was that I would stay and talk to them afterwards and I sent Michael back to the office because I thought they were getting a bit over personal and so off he went there's the vice chancellor and I stood with them in Fulton Court as they kind of berated me and it was terrific there was about a hundred of them or whatever and Brian the wonderful security uh, director of security stood there very big like that. And I thought, they're not really going to do anything except shout at me. And there was a great moment when they started going on, and one of them was pointing his finger at me. And he was going, you don't... I said, don't give me you don't understand. I said, I was standing here doing exactly what you're doing to a twat like me 40 years ago. <laughs> and he kind of was a bit taken aback like this. And then he got... The argument got a bit higher. And then eventually I said to him, I said, now look here, comrade. And they all went, ooh. And it was a terrific feeling, and I did say, and I mean it, that, you know, that legacy of protest and the legacy uh, of, of, of the expression of your views is absolutely sewn into the culture of Sussex and other universities. And, you know, we really do value it, and it's one of those things we do say to the students, you need, look, you do have to trust me here. I really believe in this. I did this. But don't come to me with your in at AGMs. Don't come to me and say, you've got a mandate. You've got a mandate. Go out and do the politics and get the vote. And I turned to a complete old lefty, which is very lovely for me. So, so that's that. So in the rest of my life, as, as Christopher mentioned, I, did, I, I have a consultancy, and I'll talk a little bit about what that's based on, not in order to tell you about the consultancy, but really because I think equality and diversity, or at least some, some talk around values, I think, can help us through some of the turbulence that we're encountering. Um, and I write and I broadcast and I serve on various boards. And I must have been, I'm standing here feeling just a little bit nervous because there are a number of distinguished people in the audience. There are some distinguished people in the audience that I know. Um, I mean, particularly Alison, your, your, your president, who's, you know, enormous contribution to HE over the last 20 years. David Watson, the former vice-chancellor of the University of Brighton, who speaks more eloquently than anybody, really, on, on uh, education and its contribution to, to society. Um, uh, Mary Kernock Crook, who, who runs uh, UCAS and has completely uh, uh, reorganised that in a way that I think has, has raised the profile of that, but in a sense has taken an awful lot of the stick over the last period, for which we thank you very much indeed, Mary. Um, and also the former registrar of the University of Sussex, Jeff Lockwood, who I know is going to be honoured by you later, but Jeff is a remarkable servant to higher education, and so uh, he said to me before, you know, he'd be taking notes, and I I felt like saying, no, I, actually, we've all taken notes from you over many, many years, Jeff. I used to call Jeff Thomas Cromwell because he'd outlived so many vice chancellors. <laughs> uh, but it's great to see you here tonight, Jeff. Um, just by the way, I'm to lie, you've had a conference today. I'm so glad there won't be any feedback forms to this particular bit. That I, hate, I so hate those things. If there are any, could I just have nine out of ten? No one's ten. I accept that. That's fine. But if you could give me nine, I'd be, I'd be grateful. I did a conference recently, and there was a pile of them, and I had a look. And somebody had written next door to my contribution, they said, if I only had an hour left to live in my life, I'd want to spend it listening to a speech by Simon Fanshawe. And there was an asterisk, and I turned to the continuation page, and they'd written, because it would seem like eternity. <laughs> so I, I very much hope you won't feel like that by the end of my contribution. 
I always say I don't, don't mind people looking at their watches, but it always annoys me when they start to tap them to see if they're still working. So, um, but, but anyway, but thank you very much indeed, Deed, for asking me to think a little bit about the turbulence that we're going through, which I think uh, is exciting. I think we would be wrong. Whatever we feel about the difficulties and the challenges, I think we would be wrong to see this as anything other than an exciting moment for us. There may be all sorts of things wrong, and there's no doubt about it that the government's policy has been wonky, uneven, in many respects badly delivered. Certainly it's been very badly advocated in the public space. But whatever, we're undergoing an absolute Probably the largest and uh, the most uh, uh, turbulent time I suppose higher education has gone through since, in living memory at least, uh, the, the Robbins report in 63. But it's a real revisiting of some of the things that, that, that we think universities are for. And, you know, we are dealing in, in the sort of micro, if you like, immediately of things about how core and margin will play out, you know. Will that further widen the gap between universities or, or, or will it introduce kind of competition which will raise standards? You know, what will be the impact of private providers? How long will they stay in the market? What will people's loyalty to them be? How will the international market hold up? Will the government's policies on visas finally overwhelm the international market on which we're coming increasingly to rely? And will the REF ignite a kind of Dutch auction amongst salaries of the high-performing academics? Equally, Will pay bargaining go local and that will that again start an auction in the high performing academics and, and change the kind of basis on which many of them are paid? And of course with record graduate unemployment, what will be re the response of graduates who see employability as a key output from their degrees? What will be our response to that? I don't plan to deal with those in detail. That's what you do in your everyday jobs. Those are the details that you have to go through. I was going to say nine to five, but it's probably more like eight, eight to eight. And you work incredibly hard and imaginatively on those details. I do think that it's worth just thinking a bit about um, uh, the, the, the AAB. I mean, one of the things that I think is interesting about AAB, and I mean, for Sussex, in a sense, it's a huge opportunity. It's the first time for a very long time that we've had an opportunity to expand in the home market. We haven't been able to do that before. But it's also clear to me that a number of universities, and if I might call them the top of the, the range, the Russell Group and others, are not going to compete on AAB, AABs. They're not interested. They don't want more students. They can't cope with more students. They've got capacity problems already. People, uh, particularly collegiate universities, have got capacity problems. They've got endowment problems and, whole, and so on and so forth. So it will be very interesting to see how it plays out. And I think we should be careful about making predictions, but we should watch very, very carefully. I don't think it introduces competition in a way that will, in, will improve standards, by the way. I don't see Sussex's standards dramatically improving just because we can expand the number of clever students we've got. We've got a lot of clever students already, and what drives our ability to deliver high standards is not the cleverness of our students, it's our commitment to delivering high standards to the students that we've got. But I think we should keep a watching eye out on that, because I think it might be interesting and not play out in the way that we think. And the second thing to say is I think that local pay bargaining is inevitable. I think that's bound to happen. But what will be interesting is the way in which it happens, who goes first, and the response of, of, of UCU and others. Because in many respects, it offers UCU members considerable benefits. At the current time, of course, it offers universities considerable benefits to stay within national pay bargaining when settlements are so low. But it's worth just thinking, I think, about that. But I won't deal in detail with those things. What I wanted to talk about, really, was, was four things that I think uh, will equip your institution for success in, as I say, turbulent and exciting times. And the four things I thought I'd explore are, firstly, our ability to make the case for universities to a broad range of the public so that they see university as a, an achievable aspiration for their children. The second is to make universities relevant to work and life in the 21st century. The third is to understand what students and probably parents value about particular institutions. And lastly, to think a bit about how we define our institutions, how we enhance our ability to promote our particular distinctiveness in the academic galaxy, what I call the soul of the universities. It's the fiction of the universities, what story we tell and why that's important. I think making the case to the public is absolutely crucial. Um, universities must strive for, a bigger, for, for an ever greater social mix. And although there's been incredible improvements in winding participation over the, over the period, it is only still 40% of the population's children who go to the university, and it is still largely a middle-class uh, pursuit. 
You know, 60% of families simply don't see universities as a real aspiration for their children. And we ought to change that. And the reason we ought to change that is not a kind of abstract one. It's as absolutely central to what we do as institutions, as learning institutions. Diversity matters to institutions in an educational sense, not just in some abstract political sense. And the best expression of this that I've ever heard was in a speech at a conference where I was very privileged to share the platform with Chris Brink, who is the, university, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Newcastle. Now, Chris has a very particular take on this because he was the first post-apartheid Vice Chancellor of Stellenbosch University. And that was a remarkable exercise in transformation. And he makes a very interesting point about that exercise in transformation. During the apartheid era, universities stood out against the government. They said, no, you won't tell us who to recruit. You won't tell us what to study. We will, as far as we can, recruit whomsoever we want. So once apartheid had been defeated and there was a new government, they could hardly turn around and say, well, now what we'll do is we'll do what the government wants. Because they spent all their time saying, we're not servants of the government. We're not going to do what the government wants. So Chris, in defining a strategy of transformation in Stellenbosch, had to find an educational reason for doing it, not a political reason or a governmental reason or a policy reason. And he expresses it thus. He says, diversity has an inherent educational value. That is why we need more of it. The university is an educational institution. Our business is about knowledge. That means that we all have to learn all the time. Students learn through their lectures, their assignments, their tutorials. Staff learn through their research, through their interaction with the community and through their teaching. One way or another, we all have to learn and keep on learning. And we will learn more from those people, those ideas, and those phenomena that we do not know than from those that we know only too well. Diversity is at the heart of what we do as institutions, and that's why winding participation matters. It's a key educational quality of our institutions. And curiously, at the moment, I think there's something odd gone on since the 60s when that movement started to broaden the appeal and entry of universities after the Robbins Report, is that curiously now, 52% of people in the country think that too many students go to university. And you think to yourself, well, that's interesting. Is that almost the 60% whose kids don't go? No, it's not, interestingly. More of that 52% are ABC1s, who think that people shouldn't go to university. And you begin to think, actually, what's this about? And I think what it's about is that we have allowed ourselves to accept the kind of Daily Mail case that when you widen participation, when more kids go to university, inevitably, standards drop. And people write about basket weaving and golf course management. Now, actually, being a great basket weaver or really well managing a golf course is bloody difficult. <laughs> And we teach it, where we teach it, to very high standards when we do it well. And we shouldn't allow ourselves to be cornered by those that will suggest that, in fact, if you admit more people, you lower standards. It's a, it's a, it's a real, mis, it's a real misapplication of principle, that. And it is true, still, that, you know, we've dropped behind, notwithstanding the massive expansion uh, of the university population, which has doubled from 20% to 40% from 1995 to 2008, we are still falling behind in the OECD League. We've dropped from 3rd to 15th, and we're behind uh, Finland and Iceland, who respectively are 80 and 78%. And in Kensington and Chelsea, you have Finnish and Icelandic levels of participation, I suspect, as you don't in poorer estates. And that damages the case for universities. If we're going to get public support for universities, notwithstanding that there's less public finance for universities, if we want universities to be embraced and defended by the population in a way that, frankly, they're not at the moment, we have to get out there and make the case for them. So what are universities for? That's my second point, really. What are they for? How do we make them relevant to the challenge of not just work, but life and work in the 21st century? At Sussex, we say that our purpose is to develop, deliver innovative and inspiring research, scholarship, teaching and learning that leads to positive change in individuals, organisations and societies. Now, mission statements always have that slightly funny thing. I always like to apply the Simon Hoggart test to uh, any statement like that, which is to put the opposite and wonder whether it makes any sense, because you would not have a mission statement or a university whose purpose was to deliver uh, dull and uninspiring research, scholarship, teaching and learning that doesn't lead to any kind of positive change in individuals, organisations, society, quite clearly. 
However, what we're doing there, and the key bits of that, is that the University of Sussex is about change. That's the key thing for us. We deliver learning and research in relation to change, to, do, to achieve change. So what that does is it focuses the university's brain, if you like, on its contribution to society and the world. I think that if you think about what are the key functions of universities, I think they're where you go on a journey of self-discovery and a discovery of the world. I think you go to develop and deploy the knowledge and skills you need to live and work in the next generation. And you go to embrace a changing world and to find your place in it. And in doing that, I think universities should be generators of social obligation. I think they should be catalysts of public commitment, of enterprise, discovery, understanding. They are, the, they are centres of collective learning and they should promote the engagement and the involvement of people. They're crucially places where teaching and research combine to produce networks of investigation, invention, exploration and discovery. They are not just about salaries, but they're about quality of life. And in current evidence indicates that graduates are happier as well as wealthier than their non-graduate counterparts. And it would be a tragedy if university was merely regarded as a route to employment. And when I was thinking about this the other day, I just thought it'd be fun to look back and wonder what Robbins is. In 1963, what did Robbins suggest as were the uh, aims and objectives of the university? And Robbins' report said, the Robbins' principle that institutions should have four main objectives. Instruction in skills, the promotion of the general powers of the mind so as to produce not mere specialists, but rather cultivated men and women. To maintain research in balance with teaching, since teaching should not be separated from the advancement of learning and the search for truth. And four, to transmit a common culture and common standards of citizenship. Skills for life and work. That's what we should talk about with universities. We shouldn't be cornered again by thinking that what universities are about is a restrictive notion of what makes graduates employable. What we should think about is what makes graduates employable in the current context, in the economy that we're developing. And those skills are creativity, flexibility, the ability to work collectively, I'll give you a small example. We did a wonderful project. Dennis Healy, the, um, the former Labour Chancellor, and his sadly now dead and wonderful wife, the biographer Edna Healy, live very close to Sussex. And uh, in conversation with the Vice Chancellor, and, uh, and a couple of times me as well, my, I had a strange relationship with Dennis because my father and he fought in the war together. So I have this very peculiar relationship with him because every time I see him, my telling view of him is this Labour Chancellor. My father used to go, bloody hell, it's Dennis again at it. What? You know, <laughs> screaming at this Labour politician. And then they were old mates in the war. So I always have this wonderful image of Dennis. It's, it's great. He's a wonderful man. Um, anyway, he has photographed everything that he's ever done. He has this extraordinary archive. Of photographs. And Edna was a biographer of, and writer of great uh, 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 talent. And so the art history student at Sussex asked if they could go and do a project about Edna and Dennis, which they did. And they turned up for four days at their house down the road. And there was about 25 of them. Edna, by the way, cooked them lunch every single day, aged uh, 92. And they arrived and they curated a project called Dennis and Edna using the photographs and Edna's narration on the 20th century. And they would sit there and they fell in love with this old couple. They didn't really know who they were when they turned up, but they fell in love with them. And they fell in love with them because Dennis and Edna gave them a sense of history and a sense of their place in the world. And what the kids got out of it was the ability to look at knowledge, the photographs and what Edna told them, edit, analyse, reassemble, put together an argument, mount an exhibition, publicise the exhibition, get people to it, arrange the introduction, and make it a success. A fantastic project. Yes, vocation in one sense, but actually based in a notion of skills flowing from knowledge and passion. So we don't want to be driven into a corner where we suddenly think that the only thing that's instrumental in universities is science. And I'm not in any way underrating science. The contribution of science and social science is enormous. We know that. But we mustn't be allowed to think either science is the only thing that in the end contributes to the solution of the problems. You will remember another Sussex academic, Asa Briggs, our second vice chancellor, worked at Bletchley Park where they decoded German code messages. 
And one of the best ways, one of the biggest contributions to decoding them was done by historians and linguists who understood how Germans talked and how Germans would be likely to phrase telegrams. And what they realised was, in one part, that Germans often do not ever, even in secret telegrams, do away with rank. And so they continued to, to serve, to, to attach people's ranks in the telegrams. And of course, they started to repeat the words, and that was spotted by historians and linguists. So the creativity that you bring to the solution of problems is what students are interested in, whether it's science or whether it's arts or whether it's social science. It's the creativity in the mind and the, and the ability to work uh, collectively and flexibly that we ought to be promoting as the value of universities. And if you think about science too, whilst it is of course instrumental, and uh, Alison talked about you know, the, 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 the battle between what will happen kind of you know, post-antibiotic, if you like, um, it takes a long time for discoveries to find their true effect. I'll give you a very good example. I would pick this example, wouldn't I? But Viagra. Now, Viagra is a, a, is a great drug. Now, Viagra was... <laughs> Viagra... It's interesting who laughs and who doesn't when you say that kind of thing. But Viagra, terrific, terrific. Now, it started as a result of a Nobel, Peace Prize winning, uh, Nobel Prize winning piece of research in the early 80s, which was about nitrous oxide. And it, the point about Viagra is it's a capillary drug. That's the point about it is it basically opens up the blood vessels and allows the blood to flow. That's why it works. But to start off, it was all about heart disease. What they did was they gave it a, they gave it a test on a bunch of men. And being a very typically male drug, it completely bypassed the heart and went straight <laughs> to the crotch, you see. Very typical male drug. And they discovered its secondary purpose. Rather wonderfully... About four or five years ago, um, a child in Newcastle, in Tyneside in 2006, called Lewis Goldfellow, was born with an inability to breathe clearly because his lungs were tight. And what they did was they gave him a tiny amount of Viagra and it opened up his lungs and he started to breathe. And he now lives. I once termed this from erection to resurrection. <laughs> But the point of it, you can see the point I'm making, apart from being yet another salesperson for Viagra, the point I'm making <laughs> is obvious. The point is that you don't know what discoveries are going to flow from the pursuit of knowledge. You know some of them, but you don't know all of them. You know, questions rather than answers are what universities are often about. And so the purpose of universities is to develop skills in young people, primarily. Yes, architects, accountants... People who have technical and vocational needs. I don't want my architect, my house to be built by an architect who's got a degree in origami. I want them to know what stress-bearing loads are all about. But I want them also to be able to work creatively as a team because I want that thing finished on time. And I want it designed imaginatively and beautifully in a collaborative way that uses the skills of lots of different people. It's collaboration. It's about skills. So how do we make the case to prospective students then, if we're going to make the case for universities? Firstly, I think we've got to make the case that actually it's a positive choice to go to university. It shouldn't just be a lazy choice. You shouldn't just wander from school into university without thinking about it. We should encourage in everything we do in our relationships with schools to make sure that kids make a positive choice, that they have a reason to do it. They're buying into something very specific. Now, should all clever kids go to university? I'm actually not convinced. Um, David Willits, uh, uh, when he made his first speech as uh, universities and science minister. In effect, he kind of made the case for further education. He said this. He said that a trap he wished to avoid was, quote, privileging theoretical over applied, cerebral over manual. He said rigor and excellence are not confined to intellectual pursuits. They're just as evident and necessary in craftsmanship, in technical spheres, in manufacturing. The argument is put by David Hume in his essay of refinement in the arts. An advantage of industry and refinement in the mechanical arts is that they commonly produce some refinements in the liberal. Nor can one be carried to perfection without being accompanied in some degrees with the other. The same age which produces great philosophers and politicians, renowned generals and poets, usually abounds with skillful weavers and ship carpenters. We cannot reasonably expect that a piece of woolen cloth will be wrought to perfection in a nation which is ignorant of astronomy or where ethics are neglected. And he makes a beautiful case in a way, Hume, doesn't he? For the ecology of education. 
for an understanding that where kids go in order to further their knowledge and further their lives must be about an exact choice and not a general choice, not a casual, oh, whatever, but actually a desire to do something specific. And we need to help them, and we need to help their parents help them. Um, and, of course, the Sutton Trust, you know, in some very interesting and controversial research, found that not only students on free school meals represent just 2% of the intake at the 25 most research-led institutions, but that independent school pupils are six times more likely to go to a top university than a student from a comprehensive. However, the Sutton Trust research also showed that added value, sorry, that research into added value shows that state school students get a disproportionate number of top degrees compared with their numbers. So what does that tell you? That tells you about where value is really added by universities. And what conclusion does that leave us when it comes to encouraging kids to make a positive choice about universities? And what puts kids off? Well, at the moment, oh, I'm going to have to make David Willits's case for him now because the government has mishandled this so badly that it's almost criminal. The fees argument has got so out of hand now that kids are saying, I can't afford to go to university. When did you last see the headline in any of the newspapers, university education is still free at the point of delivery? Have you seen that recently? Have you ever seen any article that reinforced the absolute fundamental principle that university education is free at the point of delivery? Whatever you think about fees... My own view is that I think they've risen too fast and too quickly, but I have no argument with the principle of fees, which is that if the benefit is shared between the state and the individual, it's reasonable, it seems to me, for the cost to be shared between the state and the individual. I think there are all sorts of things about the withdrawal of funding for arts and humanities and other issues, but the principle of fees, it seems to me, fair. Let's not get into the detail of, the, of, of whether or not they've risen too fast. That's what we're coping with. That's what we've got. That's where we are. But here's the truth. If you're a man, if you go to the BBC and look up for the, look, the student calculator up, you'll find the following. If you're a national average wage and you're a man, you will make your first payment, on a, this is on a 9,000 fee incidentally, you'll make your first payment when you're 25 years old and you will make a payment of £7 a week. The highest payment you will ever make is when you're 49 and it's £35 a week, which at that point will be 3.5% of your salary. If you're a woman, the first payment will be at 30 and you will make a payment of £3.75 a week. You will pay between the ages of 30 and 34 and you will never pay again. You will pay a total of £1,018 of your fees. And if you go to the other end of the scale and look at uh, graduates who go into business, male graduates, first payment at £21.25 a week, highest at £37.00. £64 a week, 5% of salary. Female, first payment at 21 is £20 a week. Highest at 39 years old, £36 a week. Those are not onerous repayments. We have got to take the responsibility as universities to go out into schools and say to kids, do not be put off by the fees. Whatever you feel about the fees, whatever you feel about your own anxieties, you may well think that there should be he says, prejudicially, a continuing subsidy to the middle class by providing higher education just for free. That happens to be my view. That's why I think fees are actually progressive. But whatever you feel about fees, please get out there and say to school students, this is not an onerous burden. What is an onerous burden, and where we really have to work hard as well as universities, is the cost of living at universities. That's the barrier to kids. Now, we know this. A lot of you will work in student support, student services, Chris's marvellously named department, Student Affairs. That must be a busy job. <laughs> Don't let your university be pushed into fee waivers just to lower the overall amount, average, of the fees. Go for bursaries. Go for the highest amount of bursaries that you can possibly squeeze out of your budget and make it available without question easily to the broadest range of students that you possibly can. At Sussex, we've gone for a 40 grand below 40 grand, absolute, unilateral. If your family earns less than that, you're entitled to a bursary. Come to us and we will do it. We'll do bursaries, we'll do fee, uh, uh, rent, uh, rebates, and so on and so forth. That's the cost that puts kids off universities, and we really, really have to win that argument out there. And I am so fed up with the argument being lost 
just because it's been put forward by a Conservative administration where you've got a Labour government that's too pusillanimous to admit that we introduced fees in the first place, and then you've got a Conservative government that was too foolhardy to realise they shouldn't have been raised fast enough. But nonetheless, we've got to get outside either of those debates, and we've got to go out there, I think, and advocate the low cost of fees and the fact that we've got bursaries and we want kids to come to universities really, really early. And we need to do lots of work out there. I mean, we just need to spend a lot of money, you know. We've trebled what we spend at Sussex on, on widening participation this year to four and a half million. And we're going to have a, a partnership uh, arrangements with 80 schools by 2016. There are absolute evidence, as you all know, that if you get out into schools and you get kids early on and you say, we're your university, the chances of them coming is vastly increased. We really need to do that as universities. I think we need to understand what parents value too and students value about universities. And this is where I think fees do muddy the waters. Because there's a lot of chat on about students as consumers, really. And one of the problems with that is that once you start talking about the notion of the fee and the course, you get yourself into serious trouble. At the moment, scientists for years have argued that they're subsidising the arts. Anybody like you who works in the engine room at the university knows perfectly well it's the other way around. But for years, the science departments have got away with this argument. We now know that the arts subsidises the sciences. Very simple reason. It's cheaper to teach arts than it is to teach sciences. If you tie the fee to the course, and you tell an arts and humanities student that they're paying nine grand, and they know that it only costs three grand to teach the actual course, and that it costs 15 grand to teach the science course, they're going to be sitting one day, dwindling, you know, doodling away in a seminar. It doesn't take much. You don't have to be a maths graduate to work out that you're paying 9,000 pounds and 6,000 pounds, that is going over the way to support the biochemists. You cannot tie the fee to the course. You have to tie the fee to the experience. And there's a good reason for that. Going to university is not just about tutor time. Going to university is about the whole experience. It's being part of a community that's engaged and involved in academic understanding and the pursuit of truth and inquiry. Our Vice-Chancellor recently gave a speech at a conference called Enhancing the Student Experience. And Michael Filing said this, and I wholeheartedly agree with him. He said, universities are much more than warehouses that sell off the shelf qualifications and students are more than consumers purchasing degree certificates. Good universities are ones that believe teaching is best when it's directly informed by research. Their excellence flows from their commitment to both excellent research and outstanding teaching, not because they concentrate on one at the expense of the other. Institutions need to take a holistic view recognising that every aspect of an institution contributes to the student experience. When we talk about the student experience, we're looking at complex, ever-shifting, multifaceted concept. Universities are communities where people come together to create and share knowledge. We do students a disservice if we value them as anything other than active participants in those communities. Yes, we benefit enormously from the idea that what we deliver to students has to be of high quality and high value. And the NSS, for all its faults, has been a fantastic vehicle of improvement in my university. There is no doubt about it that when I took over as chair and Michael took over as vice-chancellor and we sat down and we worked out what we thought were the key things that needed to be done, NSS was at the top. We were languishing. And we said, Michael said to the academics, look, everybody have a look at their scores, look at the particularities of your subject, Put together a subject plan, make that into a school plan, let's make that into a whole university plan, let's see what we can do in that one year. And that one year, we made an enormous improvement in the NSS. And people not only felt very good about that success, there was a genuine improvement in the quality of what students were getting, and of course, it started to reposition Sussex in the eyes of future students. So I'm wholeheartedly in favour of the idea that students should be at the centre of the system. But on the other hand, they're not consumers. They're active participants. They're there to debate, to be critical, and to demand, but not just to demand. They're not sitting there any longer and being spoon-fed. They're not consumers. They are actually active producers. And I think the last point I want to make, really, is, th is this notion about defining our institutions. The key thing that faces us now as people talk about a market in education is that each institution has to understand how to create its own market and not merely to follow the one it thinks it's in. And the way you do that, I think, 
Apart from, we, we need incentives to do that, both within and without. But I think the, the key thing that you do in doing that, and that's why I talk about the fiction, about the soul of the university, the way you do that is to understand what it is that you do that is very particular. And I used a, a funny analogy the other day in talking about this, but I do think this holds. It's a bit like the connection between haute couture and off the peg. Because not all your courses and not all your research is haute couture. A lot of the stuff is really good off the peg. I don't know where this, oh, this comes from, McGee's. It's the Donegal Taylor, so it's not much help because they don't have a line. But I had a Hugo Boss suit on the other day. It is not, by the way, a haute couture Hugo Boss suit. But it's a very high quality off the peg suit, bought in a sale also, by the way, because uh, we don't get paid as chairs of universities. I just thought I'd mention that since Alison was here from Hefke and after all, they've still got some money left. But nonetheless, <laughs> my point is this is that you've got to have excellence across the board, but you've got to define yourself by what you're really terrific at. And that might be academic. It might be the combination of academic and something else. It might be your history. I'm doing some work with Lincoln at the moment. I love Lincoln's history. I love the idea that Lincoln was created by a bunch of people who decided that Lincoln should have a university not very long ago. And they raised the money, damn it, and they made a university. I love that. Sussex is 50. Sussex came out of a desire to find a new way of learning at universities. Embedded in Sussex are two key things. Interdisciplinarity, the idea that you learn one subject in the context of another, that what you're doing is producing the rounded person of the Robbins report. And the second thing is that Sussex is committed to the idea that you change the world, that you have an obligation to the world. And so when you build this definition of a university, look, do look into the stories, the fictions, the soul of the university, and ask yourself, what is this place really about? And how do we build that into the future? What will our alumni be thinking in 40, 50 years' time? Because I tell you, Sussex has got an extraordinary ability to do that, partly because it was the first of that group, I think, and it was, in a sense, born in a, in a kind of a, a, a sort of crucible of, uh, of sort of heat, if you like, because of the, that post-war educational movement. But actually, if you go and talk to alumni at Sussex, they come up with very similar things about what they think their experience at Sussex was like. I have to tell you, for me, it was a life-changer. Absolute life-changer. I was on my way to Oxford, I had a place at Oriel, I'd been to public school, I'd done the whole thing. Off I went to Oriel with my mate Chris Watson, he went off to Magdalen, we got back on the train on the way home. He was fizzing. He was translucent with excitement as he sat opposite me on the Didcot Bone Shaker. Any of you remember that far back when there wasn't a direct train from London to Oxford? And he had to go to Didcot from Oxford on this funny little train. And he was just, just fizzing. And I sat there and looked at him and I thought, I'm not. What's wrong? Something's off. I don't this is not right. I don't want to do this. And then I went to Sussex, and it was great. They were occupying the VC's office. Oh, this is the place for me. <laughs> we did, actually. I, had said I was the last of that kind of gang of sort of political students, you know. And we occupied the refectory to bring an end to apartheid. <laughs> well, don't laugh. It worked, you know. <laughs> not a day goes by that Nelson doesn't thank us for that one, I tell you. <laughs> But Sussex has a soul. You all know, if you dig deep into the institution that you work for, you know that it has a soul. You've got to get that now right at the front of what you present to prospective students. Tell that story. Make it distinctive and chase the market. Create the market. Create the market for what you offer. And make sure that when you say to every single student and every single member of staff that you recruit, this is why we want you, because we do that, because we're about this. They've got a really clear idea of that. Because if that happens, we will begin to offer a fantastic array of experiences to potential students. If, on the other hand, we merely follow the market, we will drift into homogeneity, we will all end up doing business and law, we'll then end up in competition with the private providers, and we will lose that that makes us really great, which is the soul that we want to cherish. One of the things that I think helps me to reach those kind of conclusions is this work that we do on diversity, as I said before, um, that Chris Brink so beautifully summed up. And the reason that I do this stuff, and I mean, what all we do really is go in and help institutions uh, uh, decide on some kind of priorities that will actually happen rather than a kind of policy. We go in and, you know, because I mean, you can drown in policy and data in this area. So we help institutions to reach some very practical, high-level policies, which we think really will change the institution. 
But in the end, you call it, well, I call it equality and diversity, the language is beginning to be very creaky. What it's really about is understanding and the transmission and the living of values of the institution. It's really about understanding who in the institution is experiencing barriers to success. Where are the barriers? How can we overcome them? Don't let's ask the ordinary, dull questions, which are the ones we're used to asking. We can count the number of black students. We can count the number of women. We can count the number of gay students. All that is important. But what's fundamentally important underneath that is, number one, what is their experience rather than their numbers? What is the qualitative uh, data that we can take out of that experience rather than the quantitative data. But more importantly, let's ask bigger questions and more deeply probing questions about who we think are really experiencing the barriers to achievement of potential. Because that, in the end, is what we're in the business of doing. Tearing down barriers to achievement and exhorting and providing the framework in which people can reach their full potential. So to me, when I talk about equality and diversity, that's what I mean. I mean getting inside the institution, understanding where those barriers are, and understanding where the opportunities to expand your potential are, tearing down the former, expanding the latter. So that's the kind of work we do, and it's great fun. It's really great to see universities take on practical changes like that, and we really enjoy it. And on a practical, very, very practical level, we get measured on it. The NSS measures the experience of students, and if you don't get those barriers down and you don't provide the framework where people really enhance their potential, they won't have a good experience. If you don't get the right students and the right staff, I apologise, and you don't retain the right staff, you won't do that unless you understand them well. And that's another, that's another way of reaching into, to, uh, using diversity and, 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 uh, and equality, of reaching into an understanding there. And further, that then improves the quality of teaching and learning. That's about understanding a more complex view of the different needs of people than just putting them into big groups and saying, well, we'll get the black students over here and the gay students over there. Somehow they've all got homogenous needs. We know that's not true, but that can be the effect of some of these policies. As I always say, when you, I work with a lot of housing associations, and you always end up saying, you know, what you don't want to do is kind of put a mosque over there for the Muslims and a disco over there for the gays. You know, it doesn't work, you know? What you need is a more complex analysis of people's individual needs whilst recognising that there is persistent bias and persistent prejudice that we also need to tackle. So diversity really, I think, helps us to do that in this very complex situation. So what I'd like to do by ending, really... Oh, I just took, you know, I will just talk briefly about governance. I think one of the things that these questions raise is now what is the form of governance that we need? And our relationship with you is absolutely crucial in this respect. At the University of Sussex, I'm very lucky to work with an extremely good team of senior administrators, all of whom are prepared to be challenged and to step up to the plate at the point at which they are. It's an open and uh, a critical friend relationship, and it's terrific. And I, have, I had a wonderful uh, uh, discussion with one of um, Jeff's successors the other day. Uh, we're trying to get the papers for the council right. And I wrote an email to, to John, which sounded a little bit like, can I have a look at the papers before the meeting and then I'll mark them and send them back to you before you put them out? And, I, and we had a fantastic discussion, but actually what we both realised, what we were trying to get to, was we wanted to put information in front of the governors that was actually of use to the governors, and which was clear in its message to the governors about exactly what we wanted them to do with it. And that's, the, that's what we were trying to achieve. And I think governance now is taking on an even greater importance for three reasons. Because governance now is going to have to, along with management, have the ability to horizon scan and assess risk in a way that we haven't had to do before. Before, our money has come from Hefke, give or take a bit of this and a bit of that. We've by and large been able to negotiate a block grant settlement. We won't be able to do that anymore. We have to assess the risk and, and scan the horizon in a wholly different way than we ever did before. What that means is that we then have to have discussions around particular subjects of a far wider uh, nature than we do at the moment. We can't any longer just going on taking little slices of life and seeing where we are. We now have to start looking at discussions around overseas students or whatever. We have to start looking at in terms of not just a slice of the moment, but we have to start looking in terms of trends, markets, threats, and much wider 
considerations. And the last thing is that means that the, the dreaded phrase, the KPIs, have to change. And in a sense, we've got the P bit, we understand that, we get the performance bit, we get the indicator bit, it's the key bit. What are the key ones now? And they're going to have to be qualitative as well as quantitative now. And so governance has got to start to be far more discursive and wide-ranging than ever did. And I think that raises a whole series of questions about who you then recruit. So just finally, I just want to toast the university, really, um, by reading you something that comes from 65 years ago. And it's the response by John Macefield, the then Poet Laureate, to the toast of the honorary graduates at the University of Sheffield. And he said, there are few earthly honours more to be prized than this which you are now giving to us. There are few earthly things more splendid than a university. In these days of broken frontiers and collapsing values, when the dams are down and the floods are making misery, when every future looks somewhat grim and every ancient foothold has become something of a quagmire, wherever a university stands, it stands and shines. Wherever it exists, the free minds of men and women, urged on to full and fair inquiry, may still bring wisdom into human affairs. There are few earthly things more beautiful than a university. It is a place where those who hate ignorance may strive to know, where those who perceive truth may strive to make others see, where seekers and learners alike, banded together in the search for knowledge, will honour thought in all its finer ways, will welcome thinkers in distress or in exile, will uphold ever the dignity of thought and learning and will exact standards in these things. They give to the young in their impressionable years the bond of a lofty purpose shared of a great corporate life whose links will not be loosed until they die. They give young people that close companionship for which youth longs and that chance of the endless discussion of themes which are endless without which youth would seem a waste of time. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>